It's time to get the story behind the story. Interviews with newsmakers, newsbreakers, and Vermonters making a difference. WCAX presents 802 News with Mark Johnson. Here's Mark. John Gilmore delighted audiences for more than 45 years in Vermont, strumming and singing, always smiling, always cheerful. He had a particularly strong influence on children with his long-running music radio show, Just Kidding. I recently sat down with John at his home in Elmore just before he headed south to New Orleans, where he's going to be with his family. Our conversation was upbeat, yet bittersweet. I love John Gailmore. He's a true Vermont treasure. We covered a lot of ground. We talked about life and about the importance of finding your passion. We talked about Kathy, the love of his life. And we talked about joy, the joy he felt inspiring so many kids. We ended our chat, of course, with a funny tune. First, a word from our sponsor. At Red Hen Baking Company, they believe pure, uncomplicated ingredients in the hands of skilled artisans are the building blocks for great food. They're dedicated to creating the best food from the best ingredients. You'll find an ever-changing lineup of delicious pastries, sandwiches, and soups at their beautiful cafe off Route 2 in Middlesex, just off I-89. Their breads are also available in many other locations. Led by owners Randy George and Eliza Kane, Redhead and Baking Company has been on the leading edge of the local food movement since 1999. Let, let's start with, where'd you grow up? I haven't. Okay. All, um, right. All right, fair enough. But I spent, I can go, I can do chronology. Um, I was born in Manhattan, and but didn't live there. My parents lived in Westchester County, New York near Ossining, that area. But they chose Park East Hospital in Manhattan, which no longer exists. It's kind of like all the clubs I've sung at, uh, which <laughs> no longer exist. Right. I think I'm beginning to feel like it's my fault. I put a hospital out of business, clubs, hunts. Yeah, I'm, I'm not happy with you about hunts. Oh, Number of shows I saw there are just... What a place. Yeah, great place. And met Kathy there. But I, and I opened for people, S- some amazing, iconic people. Richie Havens was maybe my favorite. Wow. Because we sat there in the green room. Freedom. Freedom. I yeah. do my impressions. Yeah. Um, Wait till you hear my impression of just kidding, so. Oh, please. Okay, good. <laughs> Mic off? No. Um, but we sat there and we were reminiscing, he was, about his history in Greenwich Village he mentioned Fred Neal, who was, you know, everybody's talking at me, and mentioned a song, had I heard this song, and I hadn't. So he took out a yellow legal pad, write down, wrote down all the lyrics and the chords, guitar chords, for me. For me, nothing. I'm a nobody. He's star of Woodstock, iconic. I mean, I, his albums, is beautiful. And he is just like he appears to be. It's mm. just gentle soul. So anyway, I, I got to open for a lot of people. Then I had my own gig, and that's when I met Kathy. When did you start playing music? Well, I took guitar lessons at 15. Started on ukulele at around 10, and then I moved to guitar. I wanted some more, two more strings. So I started uh, playing music. Um, I grew up singing in choruses. That's my roots, my musical roots, which is why I love harmonizing to my with myself on my releases on my um, but playing music in 1972 my um high school mate rob carlson and i we all we would always attend parties the same party at my high school in connecticut and we would be singing not just he and i but the group and he and I would start singing, and we'd look at each other when we were singing because there was a chemistry, a musical chemistry there. Hmm. And so he was uh, he lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and I lived in Westport, Connecticut, and then went to college in Philadelphia. But he was in a rock and roll band and got burnt out on the rock and roll scene. And I, I was getting tired of... Um, not having anybody to sing with. I wanted to sing with somebody. So we got together, and, and for two years, we toured the country. Got hooked up with a guy in New York City, 
and eventually got a record deal with Polydor, and which was a magnificent experience for me, not because it was great quality, but because it was enlightening and, a, and an incredible, indelible lesson of, about what I don't want. Because mm. I know you soured on it relatively quickly. Yeah, especially, I mean, the, the gigs were fabulous. We were playing at some wonderful New York City places, colleges around the country. Back then, almost every college had a coffee house for folk music, for acoustic music. Try finding that now. Mm. So we would sing at all these places, and uh, it was fabulous. And we, and we really did have a, a chemistry. Now, the album that came out on Polydor Records, called Peaceable Kingdom, was a beautifully produced album, but it wasn't us. I mean, they, you know, our vocals were our main, main attribute, the thing that people liked, the thing that we liked the best. But you couldn't hear them. I mean, you could in a way, but there was so much more that the producers did. And that was an indication of the New York City music business back then. Did Rob sour on it too? Um, Rob, not so much. Um, and that was why we broke up. I think we had different visions of our future. I had a vision of, of uh, making a lot of money and being and having a beautiful home in Scarsdale, 2.2 beautiful children, and being totally miserable. <laughs> and I said, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, life is short. I even knew that then. Yeah. Um, and here's another thing about the, the business. Our manager said to us, um, there are these two other guys coming up after you that were, were helping, and it was Hall & Oates. Oh. <laughs> so that's what they wanted us to be, Hall & Oates. Okay. And I did not want to be Hall & Oates. I mean, I, they're great singers, and, and some songs are terrific, but no thanks. I wanted more control over my life and my art, so, um, so I broke us up and became a soloist. Here's um, a little tidbit. I was I became a soloist in one night, one of my first gigs in Westport, Connecticut. This play, place called Mark's Place, um, with a K or a C. A K, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was um, in my first song, and he came up to me and put his index finger over his throat as if to say, you got to stop. <laughs> Someone called a bomb scare in. Oh, okay. It wasn't yeah. your music. Good. No, I don't Good. think so. Yeah. My mother was there, my friends, neighborhood people in Connecticut. Uh, we had to evacuate. So we left. The police searched and um, didn't find anything. My mother came back. <laughs> so I'm glad I don't believe in omens because... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the rest is uh, hysteria. And uh, I went on to, um, to sing more and then went to college, uh, graduated in 1970, didn't know what I wanted to do, Oof. sang in glee clubs. They called them glee clubs. We had a 90, well, no, we had an 80-man glee club, men's glee club at Penn, and it was glorious. Toured, went a, went a some countries and and then I but after graduation I still didn't know what I wanted to do professionally so my sister bless her heart kicked me in the butt and said go find yourself so that's when I hitchhiked around the continent for seven months and at Kennedy Airport when I because I flew to uh flew to France no I I'm sorry I flew to Luxembourg it was uh what was the airline? It was... Um, Lufthansa? No, Lufthansa. I don't remember the airline, but probably had someone's name attached to it, which I don't remember any names. Uh, but I flew to, to Luxembourg and... Uh, oh, Equatoriana Airlines. Okay. Ecuador. Wow. Never so I flew to it. Luxembourg and um, centrally located and started hitchhiking. At Kennedy Airport, I met a college friend who was a musician from Penn. And we arranged to get together in Paris, meet in Paris. We bought a couple of guitars and started uh, getting a repertoire together, hitching through the French Alps to Cannes, France. We started singing. 
in cafes. And we'd walk up to the proprietor and say, do you mind if we sing? We met an American girl who was our hat passer, very shrewd. And so we sang. She passed a hat. We made enough money, splitting it three ways, to stay in hotels and have all our meals. Wow. And that was my epiphany. Yeah. Because I was incredibly happy, never been happier when I was singing to people, entertaining people, and bantering and just being a part of that. And passing the hat. And passing the hat. How did you, graduating from college in 1970, how did you avoid not having to go to Vietnam? Well, um, I, uh, I knew I didn't want to go, and I wouldn't go. So it was either, it was either move to Canada or um, go to jail or something. But I, so I went... Um, I thought maybe I should be a conscientious objector because that was who I was. And, uh, sorry, this cat. Sorry, sweetheart. Um, we can get her her own mic if, if we I, need to. Yeah, she needs a mic. Uh, so I filled out, I wrote this 13-page philosophy life paper got letters from teachers who'd known me all my life, a football coach in junior high who witnessed my having to quit the team because I didn't like the contact, the violence. Um, I came from an anti-war anti, um, family, my father and my mother, everybody in my family. So my history was like that and everything. So I put it, I sent it to the draft board. Now, my response from the draft board was an appointment for my physical. <laughs> yeah. So I went for my physical, and um, and I one of the things I had was a letter from my doctor about my allergies. Okay. Seasonal allergies. So after the physical, you go to these cubicles where there's doctors sitting there. You choose the one that looks the most sympathetic. Went up to him, presented my letter, and then I went back to college. Didn't hear anything. Eventually, I I got 1A. No, well, not 1A. That's when you go. I got uh, 4F, I think it was. I don't remember. That's a long time ago. My mother got the notice that I was not going to have to serve. So the next vacation from college, I got off the train in Connecticut. My mother had organized a, um, a parade of vehicles, honking their horns, flashing their lights, as though they were welcoming the war hero home. So they were really welcoming the draft dodger home. But my mother was like that. She organized this thing. Um, so that's how I didn't have to serve, which was thankful, because I would have been an awful, awful soldier. What would your mom and dad do? Well, my father, oh boy, this might take the bulk of the interview. My father, I'll give you the cliff notes, Yeah, was born into a family of Orthodox rabbis. Uh, his name was Margolis. So he was born in uh, Passaic, New Jersey. He had no choice but to become an Orthodox rabbi. All the boys became rabbis, or at least two of them. And he was set up to become a rabbi. Then he was set up to marry the heiress to the Horowitz Margaret and Matzah Empire. Okay. Married this real rich lady. Uh, had to, had no say. It was set up. Um, they, there was no love in the relationship because it was set up. They had two kids. Um, my father started to uh, resent his upbringing and, and really regret his whole life. So eventually, he uh, did something just as unfathomable. He started, he, he needed to have someone pay attention to him. Mm hmm. So he uh, rented cars, drove them long distances, and abandoned them, leaving a paper trail so that the police would pay <laughs> attention to him. Wow. Okay. And they did. And they came to their door on Riverside Drive and said to his wife, either get this guy some help or we're going to have to uh, incarcerate him. Well, she... In, she um, did get him some help. She um, took him up to West Point, this mental hospital, and he was an inpatient there. 
And that's where he spent a little time. And my mother, my biological mother, Elaine, meanwhile, uh, was having problems of her own with men and with relationships. She needed a shrink. Well, they found one who practiced, guess where, in that mental hospital. Same place. My father and she met. And they helped each other out with their issues, confided, revealed themselves. Um, and when you do that, you open up to each other. It's easy to fall in love. Well, they did. And no one is surprised that John Gailmore's parents fell in love in a mental hospital. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Look yeah. at him. There you go. So, um, huh. and then they he divorced his wife and they got married and had my sister, who's seven years older than I am. Um, and uh, yeah, and I went on to, to, no, I didn't go on. I wasn't born yet. Um, so I, uh, then they had me six weeks early. My mother had lost a child between my sister and me. So they got me out of there and I was raring to go. Came out singing, I'm sure. Mm hmm okay. In my own way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I've I'm, I've gone all over the place chronologically. But after college, I went to Europe and started singing in cafes, and got back and started singing. I remembered something about Vermont. In when my partner and I were touring, we sang at a few places in Vermont, and there was something different. It was intangible. I couldn't put my finger on it something welcoming and just very different about Vermont. And I knew I had to be here. So I beat here. <laughs> I, I drove up with my girlfriend at the time. We drove up. We were going to go to Burlington because of the college and music scene, and I could get some gigs. We got tired in Montpelier. So we pulled over and ended up staying in a guest house right in the center of town. Lackey's Tourist Home, it's called. Something else now, but we stayed there for two weeks and drove around, and I fell in love with central Vermont. So we moved to East Montpelier. That was my first Vermont home. And uh, f there I, I heard Jack Donovan's show, uh, Vermont wow. Live, Wow! one day with these amazing musicians, Dick McCormick, Nancy Bevan, Pine Island, Banjo Dan, the Plowboys. Oh, Jesus. My God, what a treasure trove, Yeah, as they still are. And I said, boy, I'd love to be a part of that. So I paid Jack a lot of money. No, I didn't. <laughs> I um, called the station or something, and I auditioned, I guess. I don't even remember the what I did, but <clears throat> eventually I did become a part of it. And what an honor it has been to be among them and to be with Jack. And, uh, you know, and, and, oh, there's more. I mean, then that, I sang in clubs, Montpelier, Burlington, all over the place. Met Kathy at Hunts in Burlington. Um, one day at Top Notch in Stowe, I was being my immature, childish self, and a woman called me over between sets and said, sit down, how would you like to sing for kids? And I said, well, I could try it. So she organized a, a front porch gathering in her house on Saturday mornings. The local kids came, I sang to them, and it really clicked, and, and I was one of them. I could be myself. Yeah. And... Um, and that led to more to schools and the Vermont Council on the Arts, as they were called then, Vermont Arts Council now. And so they lined me up in some schools. And one day in a school, I heard kids writing songs, not writing, but singing songs, making them up on the spot, in the sandbox, on the playground. And I said, wow, wouldn't it be cool to take this natural instinct and help them uh, write songs, original songs. And that's how the songwriting started. So I was doing both, 
Plus, I was still singing in clubs for grown-ups because my brochure says prenatal through prehistoric, which <laughs> which yeah. means the entire range. And I I crave diversity in every way. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I sing at preschools and help them write songs, and then I'll, next day I'll be at a senior center singing to my fellow elders. Um, just finished singing at the Pines in South Burlington, which is a wonderful uh, residential place. I, I, you know, and I just, I love that. Mm. I love that. And, you know, the elderly, I mean, I, I'm talking about myself. We are very much like drinking grown-ups. A younger drinking, you know, want familiarity or kids like that. Go, so go back here. Wow. T- tell me about meeting Kathy. Okay. One night at Hunt's, best club in the history of the world. It truly was. And you can ask any of the performers back then, the bands, the end zones, the Kilimanjaro, you know, all of those. Hunt's was very special, thanks to Chico Lager. I sang one day, or one evening there. I had Wednesdays, I think, whatever night it was. Chico, remember. And um, I mentioned in the course of my blather that I sing for kids. And so Kathy at the time was was working at the Laraway School. At the time, it was in Johnson, school for uh, teenagers who were having problems. She came up to me between sets and said, would you ever consider singing for teenage kids? And I, I thought, parenthetically, if you are there, I'm there. Because she was gorgeous, remained so. But I didn't know how beautiful she was inside yet. And I found that out when I went. She hired me to sing. And there she was walking around and the kids were listening and singing along and I was doing what I was doing and I had a really hard time concentrating because I was so smitten. So after, she walks me in my car and I say in my lame way, so do you have family here? (laughs) Euphemism. Yeah. Are you living with someone? Do you have a love interest? She said, no, just me and my cat. She had a cat named Georgia, named after Georgia O'Keeffe, who was her favorite artist. Well, I said, just me and my dogs, Randy and Ed, and I said, maybe my dogs and your cats could go out sometime. That's all <laughs> very, I could very do. Very suave, Jeff. God, yes. <laughs> Shameful. Oh, God. So the rest, um, it worked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we were married for, uh, since in 1985, we got married. She died in 2022. So we were married f- 47 years. We lived together for five and then got married. Uh, so 42 years of marriage, and uh, yeah, it was a beautiful thing. I, I never met Kathy, but I feel like I did, you know, just following you on Facebook and watching, I guess, really seeing your reaction to her death, you know, and the whole, the clear grief that you went through. I mean, she really, as I say, I never met her, but she was a really special woman. Indeed, and changed a lot of lives, including mine. And she was a therapist. And uh, most people are convinced that's how we must have met, that I was her. Kind of like your parents. Client. Yeah, same thing. Same thing. But, uh, yeah, she was very special. And as as I said to you earlier, before the mic was on, she I'm still meeting people years and years later who, who say to me, strangers, I don't know them, your wife changed my life. Your wife taught me how to feel. Your wife just made me feel like a worthwhile human being. My God, what a tribute that is. Oh, I mean, can you say anything better about somebody than that? I don't think so. And she made me feel like a worthwhile human being, too. And uh, every day she taught me something. Not to, not to say that I didn't teach her every so often, but she taught me every moment we were together. How have you dealt with the grief how have I dealt with it? Um, well, I, I've always been a pretty positive person. And um, I have uh, dealt with it gingerly, but I sing to people. And that is an amazing 
anesthesia, not anesthesia, but adrenaline is a phenomenal thing. When I'm pursuing my passion, as in singing to people, helping kids write songs, helping grown-ups write songs, because I've worked in these elder care centers helping the elderly, like me, write songs about their past. Mm. And it's incredibly powerful. You can see it in their faces. Their eyes light up. There's nothing like music to do that. And when I'm in the, in the I won't say in the throes, because that's negative connotation. When I'm in the, immersed in my passion, I can deal with my grief. And I can, I can see Kathy smiling, knowing that I am. And she, the, the time she came to my performances, my oh my, was that heaven for me. So um, I've, I always wanted to be a fly on the wall during her therapy sessions, but obviously I couldn't do that. But um, so I, uh, very unhippa. Yeah. But she was magical and, and, um, <clears throat> and real, genuine came from, uh, she was one of five siblings, and funny, in, in her family dynamic, she was always the one, the conduit between other siblings. When anyone was having a problem, <laughs> they just went through her. Uh -huh. Not because she offered up, but it was just, she was such a natural therapist. Sounds like she found the right job. Oh boy, did she. So we had that in common too. Let's talk about your the the radio show you did for kid kids. Just right. kidding. I, I won't sing it for you right now, but I could. Yeah, how, Mike. Where did, where did that? So how did that start? <laughs> okay. Um, well, WNCS FM in Montpelier. Yeah. In the seventies, I guess it started. Had a show. They were located at the time, right at the depot in Montpelier. They had live at the depot. They called it, and Vermont artists would come and sing and invite an audience to come. The public would come and sit in, and they'd do a gig live on the radio. So I did one or two. And then I suggested, because I was already singing in schools for kids, why don't we try one for kids? Let's do a Live at the Depot for kids. And so we did one, and it was a great success. Kids came. And then I said to some poor soul, who worked at the station, why don't we have a radio show for kids? <laughs> and and they were game. It's a great station. Yeah, it was. Um, wonderful people, and I'm still getting letters and calls from people who worked there with me. The first Just Kidding show was August, 20, uh, August 29th, 1979. And not I don't know why I remember that, because they're reel-to-reel tapes. I remember putting the date on it, August 29th. And um, it went for three years on WNCS. And then uh, Ken Squire, through Greg Titus, lured me to WDEV. And I was delighted because that radio station, being the friendly pioneer and just such an important part of Vermont, it was the perfect place for me. So I did it for another 22 years there. And whenever I went to schools, I would bring uh, a tape recorder. And I would, whenever I had a break or I'd work one in, I would talk to kids and, and have them sing songs and read stories they'd written and um, be themselves. I would talk to them about life. I'd ask them questions. Not unlike what Art Linkletter used to do. I remember seeing him. Kids say the darndest things, yep. and they still do. The Arab-Israeli war, the Yom Kippur war going on, the, you know, and, and the, the results of it and, and that whole Arab-Jew relationship. What do you think of that, kids? What do you, you know, what do you, what do you think about the news? What, do you, what bothers you about the world? What, I mean, I really wanted them to feel good and candid about childhood about their childhood and about their instincts and it was just being a kid it was unscripted totally unscripted there's nothing worse than a scripted kid you know unless it's a play they're putting on or something but not on, on the radio you know you don't 
strip them of their childhood. And that's why the show was called Just Kidding, and that's why the song came, Just Being a Kid, Just Kidding. And uh, so I loved doing it. It was wonderful being a part of that station and doing it. And then, you know, it just it ran its course, and it was time to move on. And I have, I think I have cassettes of most of the shows. Wow. Yeah, because I'm, I'm still running into people who are my age or somewhere middle-aged, and they say, uh, you came to my school when I was th- in third grade. We wrote the song about the turtle in the tuxedo. And I've had, I've had grown-ups actually sing the song they wrote, mm. <laughs> which, I mean, what's, what's more mm. gratifying than yeah. that? Yeah, to, to re- be remembered that way, and I guess I made the right choice. Well, and you're right. I mean, WDEV was the perfect place to have that. I mean, a, a, a station that'll carry music to go to the dump by. Right. You know, it was. It really was the a, a place of eclectic programming, and, and it, it was Vermont in yeah. a nutshell. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I can't think of a lot of other stations that it would have worked. And that's that's when I first heard you. Also, and it was just and the, kidding. Yeah. And you're no, just serious. Yeah. And it was, and then there was your counterpart. I don't remember. I think I've blocked that out, that part out. <laughs> me, me too. I think. Okay, but it was, uh, it was great. They had all all sides politically, and yep. just a real um, manifestation of of who we are as yeah. humans and as Vermonters. Well, and that's what Ken was all about, which is right. hearing all different kinds of sides and. That's what the hodgepodge of what I think really kind of made it work. And, and, you know, just going back, you know, getting to work with Jack Donovan, who's still there. Oh, my God. um, Just truly one of the nicest people I've ever met. Definitely the nicest person in radio. Oh, he's lovely. Uh, Just wonderful. And that voice is what DJs all strive for. Yeah. But he doesn't strive. He just just does it. Yeah. It's so relaxed and casual and real and unaffected. I remember Mike Carey and I used to. Oh, God, Mike Carey. What a lovely person he was. And he and I used to have a good time pretending we were on the radio. And (laughs) I I remember, uh, here's an anecdote that comes from that. I was singing, where was it? Utica, New York. I was singing. And I went to the radio station to do an interview. And so the... The news commentator who was going to do the interview was trying to do well. Yeah, <laughs> he said, uh, he was talking like I do. Hi, hi, John, how you doing? Good to see you. And then he went on the air and said, <laughs> and Now, John Gilmore, <laughs> just uh, totally, yeah, metamorphosis. You did, know? He, did he put his hand up to his ear like he was like cupping, the, cupping the microphone? Yeah, the the headphones. Oh my god, <laughs> it was just so funny. I had it all I could do not to crack up. Yeah, it was W O U R. And why the heck do I remember that and can't remember my best friend's name? Yeah. Hey, so go back. Is Rob still <clears throat> with us? And are you? He's with us and he's um, a brilliant songwriter and uh, uh, he still sings out, I think. And um, do you stay in touch? Doing also in a distant way. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the parting was not totally amicable, but it was because. Uh, you know, I broke up the act. Yeah. And um, he wanted to keep going. And, and we had it. We came um, came upon a real schism. Mm-hmm. Well, um, happens. Yep. And I think it, for me, it was the best thing. Let's talk about uh, your future here. So you're, you're leaving Vermont, which has got to be, I don't even think bittersweet would be a word, right? I mean, it's... It's a good word. Painful. But, I mean... Well, you know, it's painful, but what, I won't say negates the pain, but it, it modifies it, is that I'm doing the right thing, and I'm heading toward my son and his children and a great hospital in New Orleans called Oshner, and uh, fabulous. In fact, the three hospitals I've been dealing with are so uplifting, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with why I feel so good. It's not just the drugs. <laughs> it's not the the platelet transfusions that make me feel like the '60s again. It's 
it's the people. And I'm, I'm convinced that people who work in hematology and oncology know what their patients are going through mm-hmm. emotionally, unless they just hire the right people. And I'm talking about Copley Hospital here in Marsville. Yep. Fabulous. UVM up in Burlington and Ochsner. Ochsner, they say, in New Orleans. Just amazing places. And uh, so I know I've made the right choice. In fact, everyone says it would be sad to, for you to be gone, but we know you're doing the right thing. A what lot you, of smart people. Right what, here. what do you think they mean by that? I mean that they, that they know about family and the importance of family and, uh, and positivity and healing. You can't overstate that. And I, I, that's what I go for. I've always uh, um, strived for positivity. I mean, why not? I just, it's who I am. And, and here's a little anecdote from my early childhood. <laughs> You're talking about going back. Here's going way back. When I was about two and a half, my mother would put her Gerber's on, my Gerber's on the end of a spoon, put it in my mouth, and I'd go, good, 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 good. And she'd crack up. And so 10 seconds later, I'd go, Good, 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 good. Just because it was so wonderful and uplifting to hear my mother laugh. Mm, wow. And I love making people laugh. Uh, I just love doing that. And laughter is one of those spontaneous things you can't control. You just do it. I've had people ask me after a gig, why aren't you a comedian? Why don't you become a comedian? And I say, are you kidding? Then I'd have to be funny. You'd have to work at it, yeah. Yeah. And if, I, if my jokes die now, yeah. it's fine. I'm a musician. Because I'm not a comedian. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you have you have leukemia. Right. Can you share with me? what? So what's the prognosis on this? Well, the progn- I'm in remission at the moment. They just, you know, I will have periodic uh, bone marrow biopsies. And the doctor will look at them and tell me how I'm doing. And that's that's all we can do is the prognosis. You know, it's kind of a vague prognosis in that in that respect because um, every case is different, and I don't know what's ahead. I'm hoping to stay in remission forever, mm-hmm. or even maybe kick kick its butt. That would be ideal. Maybe my sense of humor might scare it away. Right. Ah, maybe if you never. just keep saying good, it'll mm-hmm. it'll that's right. Wander off to the next person. I hope. Are you scared? Well, um, I'm. I'm. As long as I'm in remission, I'm not scared. I don't like having a potentially fatal disease. It's scary to think of dying, and I think of dying pretty often. I think of, um, you know, if there's a memorial service, I, I think about that. Who's going to come? Who's going to speak? What they might say? Um, I, I think of that and how people will react to my death. I think of my obituary on occasion. I don't hesitate to to think about these things. It's, 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 they're all on my mind. Um, and I'm 76. So there's a great line from Hello, Dolly. And someone asks a woman, uh, how old are you? And she says, somewhere between 40 and death. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I've experienced... Much worse scenarios than I'm going through. Yeah, Kathy being the worst ALS. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough one. And uh, that was devastating, and in just every every conceivable way, except that it was a peaceful death. The hospital called it a good death. Lord knows they've seen bad ones. And uh, she called the shots. She wrote on the whiteboard because she had a ventilator in. It's the only way she could communicate. She wrote down one time, do you think I could have some Pinot Grigio? Because she liked Pinot Grigio. So we didn't bring it until the next day. And that night, she said, so where's my Pinot Grigio? Wrote it on the whiteboard. And uh, we put Marvin Gaye, Heard It Through the Grapevine on for Oof. her. It's her favorite song. And she, her feet were moving. She was smiling. And the um, last thing she wrote was, I just want to get this done. And then they pulled it, and she was dead in 30 seconds. Wow. Yeah. So it was, uh, 
Whew. To say that it was a memorable experience is an understatement. It was devastating. She taught me how to live and she taught me how to die. And uh, so it was a Kathy Murphy death, just like she lived. She called the shots. It was peaceful. It was, she knew the impact that she had made. We were reading emails and cards and letters that were coming in, texts from people who were thanking her for being her. She knew about all that when she died, which is the way to go. If you're going to go, you know, that was the way. What do you want to see in your obit? I mean, I, I can ask you this because I'm not 25 either. What, what do you want people to remember about you and, and memorialize about you? Well, I, I want them to, um, I want to have changed some lives for the better and help people realize how important they are, uh, how musical they are. Everyone's got a song, at least one. And uh, I want them to just feel um, like an essential part of the world and that every soul is important. And I want them to have pursued their passion. That's my message for kids. Yeah. Find it and, and pounce. And so I'm hoping that people will see my face when I'm performing or doing songwriting and how... I shine physically when I'm doing my passion, pursuing it. Everybody has something, has a reason for being here. My reason for being is music. Hey, that would make a good opening line to a song. But you found your passion. I mean, so many people right. don't. That's, the, that's sort of the tragedy. A lot there. of people don't bother to look. And some, you know, some uh, just assume that it's going to be something. Kathy always tried to teach me never to assume anything. Well, she didn't succeed totally because I still assume. But um, there are many people who just go for the money or other, other things and don't f care whether they're passionate or not. And I can't, I mean, I can't come down on them. That's just their choice. People make choices. And I try to convince kids and therefore, when they get older, grown-ups um, and grown-ups, that it feels so good to find your passion. Why am I here? And do it. Go with it. Uh, I think the lesson that you got from Kathy about never assuming is that's just gold. Mm -hmm. So true. One of the many lessons I got from her. So I don't, I try not to assume anything. And I try to, by example, let people know what an amazing feeling it is to be pursuing your passion. And people need to search, find it, because it's, it's there, it's out there. It's like kids, when they get to college or, or whatever, whatever they're, you don't know what you're going to do until really you get to college or sometime, not everybody goes to college, obviously, but be open. That's, that's a, another thing she taught me. Be open to your passion, because it's there, it's out there, waiting for you. But it might not be waiting for you. Sometimes you have to dig for it. And uh, man, um, dirt. It's in the dirt. It's, in, it's, it's everywhere. Everyone's got a reason, I think. And I'm not a religious person, per se, but there's a reason everybody's here, and they need to look for it and find it and the world would be a great place if everybody was doing what they love and found it and do it, you know. It, it's in the dirt would be a great opening line, too. It's in the dirt. Well, yeah. there is the song Dirt, which I sing everywhere okay. at all times. Okay. Because it's simplicity and it's, uh, yeah. Real. Yeah. It's real. And, and um, yeah, there are worms in there. Well, we use them to fish. I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. If there's... <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, and you plant things grow out of the dirt beautiful things so anyway all right well you say everybody's got a song in them and you you promised me that the only reason i came all the way up here is you promised me that you would you would play a song okay so let's um let's do that 
All right. I wanted to write a song that was a um, kind of a pep talk for women and girls who felt stifled by society. And uh, this is about a little girl who wanted to drive a backhoe when she grew up. We call backhoe girl. I'm getting bored with Barbies. I hate my tiny toys. I just want to dig a hole and make a lot of noise. So fit me with a hard hat. Drive me to the site. Once I'm pulling levers, it'll be all right. Back home, girl. Back home, girl. Swinging, swaying, and dig in the world I gotta do what moves me and so it sure behooves me to be a backhoe girl my classmates call me crazy my parents roll their eyes grown-ups all around me say I'm lost and quite unwise but when I'm with my bucket above it all it seems not a soul can stop me scooping out my dreams. Backhoe girl, I want to be a backhoe girl. Swinging, swaying, and digging the world. I ain't gonna do what moves me. And so it sure behooves me to be a backhoe girl. You know, it started in the sandbox, a rusty little rig. Something deep inside of me said I, I was born to dig. I thought we were in heaven, my vehicle and I. Moving earth and gravel, honey, I can make it fly. Back old girl, I want to be a back old girl. Swinging, swaying, and digging the world. I got to do what moves me. And so it sure behooves me to be a backhoe girl. Oh, backhoe girl, I'm gonna be a backhoe girl. Swinging, swaying, and digging the world. I gotta do what moves me, and so it sure behooves me. Up in that cab, I'll frolic with dreams downright hydraulic a chopper and a spreader no boy can do it better than this backhoe call me a wacko well i'm your backhoe girl that wraps it up for this edition of 802 news sponsored by red hand baking company farewell john gilmore and come back real soon <laughs>